Welcome to the 7 Days to Amazing podcast, where you learn how to make your life, business, and style even more amazing in the next week. Now your host, Sharon Haver of FocusOnStyle.com. Hello, Sheiksters. I am Sharon Haver, and you are about to be amazed. I have a very special guest on today's episode of Seven Days to Amazing. For all you fashionistas, I can assure you that you will be salivating. And for those of you who consider yourself maybe a little fashion phobic, well, don't worry. You will be inspired beyond your imagination. Alyssa Diamond is a fashion historian and expert in contemporary fashion studies. Her most recent book, The New French Couture, Icons of Paris Fashion, is available now from Harper design. Alyssa served as an adjunct professor at Parsons School of Design in the Cooper Hewitt Master's Program in New York. She has lectured at museums, universities, and private venues worldwide. Formerly a curatorial research associate at the Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, she co curated the 2004 exhibition, Wild, Fashion Untamed, and co-authored the accompanying catalog. Alyssa is the author of several other fashion and style books, including Style Mentors, Women Who Divine the Art of Dressing Today, Minimalism and Fashion, Reduction in the Postmodern Era, and Fashioning Fabrics and Contemporary Textiles in Fashion. Today, we will not only talk about the new fat French couture, but how Paris fashion can inspire your daily life. Yes, your daily life. So welcome, Alyssa. We are thrilled to have you here today on 7 Days to Amazing. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Can you um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what a fashion historian is for those of you who aren't sure and also kind of define what, what couture is? Because I know so many people, they really are a little unclear as to what real what couture is, and I know especially through the years, you know, a lot of people go to like a craft fair or something, and they see somebody's chenille sweater with the big buttons that was handmade, and they're calling it couture, and then, of course, there was juicy couture, so if you could just sort of mm-hmm. give us a little history, you know, for more of a lay person on what couture really is and, and how you got involved in it. Sure. That. Sure. So, um Couture is actually a very, very rigid structure of um, qualifications that are ordered by the Chambre de Gaulle in Paris um, that define how a garment's made and that, you know, from a more practical level, uh, 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 equal kind of the custom made. So haute couture is the the kind of high fashion, the custom made. Um, So this book kind of talks about couture from the perspective of both the artistry involved and also from the perspective of the inspiration and um, kind of drive and vision that the um, couturiers had when they established the houses and then that the new creative directors now have as they continue um, the traditions of each respective brand. So that's kind of couture. I hope that yeah, it, like in a little bit of a nutshell. Um, in terms of how I got involved, I, you know, I'm a New York girl. I don't, um, I've been to the shows in Paris, but I'm not um, in the French fashion world. But um, what interested me in in writing about French fashion was the idea that um, it's such a venerable institution. There's so much there that's about history and tradition. And um, I think the whole world kind of looks at those shows as inspiration. Um, And I wanted to kind of understand more both about how contemporary creative directors balance between the kind of very high end of the couture and the kind of more practical level of how what like what are we going to sell to customers and what are we going to license to kind of keep the commerce and things going. So um, this book actually started from from both curiosity and from the idea that um, each brand that's represented in the book, which there's um, Saint Laurent and Dior and Lanvin, um, there's Ginochi, Hermes, Louis Vuitton, Balenciaga, um, and Chanel, of course. Each of those brands are kind of were, were houses that were established sometime in the early to mid 20th century, and then have just continued to be successful in huge part because of these kind of identifiable icons that the creative directors have put forward. 
Yeah, and, and one of the things I think is so fascinating in, in um, the, the new French couture, which, by the way, folks, you know, if you're wanting to get a great Christmas present, holiday present, or you're wanting something really not only beautiful to put on your coffee table, but something that's very literate as well, th- this is the book. It, it's just besides just all these magnificent, magnificent fashion photos, they're Alyssa did an unbelievably superb job, and we'll get into that a little later, of really giving you the background of each piece. And one of the things I love about this book is how you were, yeah, it was just besides in general, is how you were able to show the old and the new, for say, so how it how it's managed to transcend decades in time with with a, a design. And one of your opening photos in here is is a picture that I actually had on my wall growing up, and that I've that I've always loved, and, and it was the um, Barushka photo, and it's a follow-on safari top and it's you know the, the amazing tan top. yes it's an amazing incredible. one incredible and I always tell women when they're looking to find their style is to find their own iconic moments of things that have inspired them and somehow it clicks into how you can find yourself within it and, and this is you know one of the opening photos in the book and then it goes in to show you how you know this outfit has change through you know Saint Laurent through years and what is the last one in here in 2013 in the suede version and it's very similar because for me I, the, the original has a special spot in my heart but it also if you look at it and this isn't your thing and you maybe weren't as familiar with the photo and, and sort of the iconic image of it you you'll start to say you know this look this style has transcended into so much so many different levels of fashion through the years I mean I know particularly because this was sort of a, a style marker for me. I remember seeing it like in the 80s and 90s in like Missy departments. Of course, it didn't have the same so cool. you know, special Very thing cool. but because I've kind of like, you know, it's been my thing. So every time yeah. I see that yeah, safari yeah. <laughs> outfit, I kind of remember, you know, where it is from, you know, some big box store like a, a Zara, you know, did a Navy silk version a couple of years ago. And then what was that line in the 80s? The, oh, my God, not Kathy Hartle. What was that name? Liz, Liz Claiborne had one once. I remember that. Sure. And yeah. yeah. So it, it's so interesting to just to be aware of these things and see how it transcends. So as we go further, one of the other things, especially in Saint Laurent, and, and then I'll, I'll let you kind of take it over going through the big eight is, you know, the tuxedo suit. And I think, you know, tuxedo dressing is just such a God. It's it's like it's like a icon and it's a it's classic and it's just forever chic for most women. And you know, for me, it was always you know that helmet helmet Newton photo stuck in my mind. But you've got the original yeah. YSL one here, and then the more modern version. And it's just such a styling trick that anyone can do to just it just goes through decades and times and always looks so right. So. In the book, you yeah, break I mean, down at the top eight. So if you want to just, you know, I'll let you kind of like freestyle how you want to sort of between iconic silhouettes or if you want to go more into designer by designer, house by house, whatever you feel gives it the most impact in the time we have today. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I, you know, I, I it, it, this is such a fun project from the perspective that it's a, somewhat of a historian's dream. You know, you're, you're really looking at um, different pieces over time and how they've evolved under all these different creative visions. So mm-hmm. what I tried to really do is instead of um, mapping the chronology of a house, which I feel like has been done a lot of different times for these brands, mm-hmm. I tried to kind of say, okay, what are the things that keep appearing time and again? What, is, what, what are like we distilling to like, you know, these are the elements that make up like the identity of Chanel or the identity of Dior. And I think that they're, they're fairly clear. Like, you know, my biggest fear was like, oh, my God, like, you missed the whole Saint Laurent Leopard story. And I think, <laughs> you know, that there's, like, there's always going to be things that there's – these are such huge, like, meaty worlds, these brands, because they've been around for over a century in some cases. But it's, like, at the same time, you know, there are things that we just know them by. So, like, for Chanel, it's, like, kind of the idea of La Garçon and this, like, masculine infused in, into the feminine and the pants suit – or the, the skirt suit and the boucle and the – quilted bag, you know, all of these things mean Chanel to us now. And I think that, um, you know, Karl Lagerfeld was kind of the first creative director that was brought in to revive a, a, a like, kind of stalwart house mm-hmm. in 1983. And he's, you know, 
since mined this like rich mythology of what makes up Chanel and what Chanel means. Um, and it's such a clear identity that like even someone who's not necessarily interested in fashion, I think, can look at something and be like, oh, that's like that's like kind of Chanel, you know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and people have, have like a comfort level there, which is exciting. So, um, you know, that was obviously like a very, you know, almost like an, an easier one because there is this kind of um, – storytelling that Lagerfeld's done so consistently for the past 30 years. But um, some of the more difficult ones were people like Marc Jacobs reviving, or not reviving, creating Vuitton Ready to Wear in, yeah. um, 19, in the 1990s. And, you know, they didn't have clothing before, so how do you take a brand that's all about luggage and make it about clothes? Um, so, you know, really looking at their process of craftsmanship and craftsmanship and how that translated into the clothes and, and what Jacobs took with him from the legacy brand. Um, so there was that piece. Um, the book, I think, as a whole is organized by the first half, part one, is um, like kind of the fashion personalities. So you have Saint Laurent, who's, um, who is the belle du jour, so like the, the kind of contemporary woman in every way um, and I think that was support that's been pretty steadily supported by everyone who's designed that brand from um, you know Eve's, Eve's to um, even to even through Tom Ford which was not incredibly critically accepted and then Pilati and um, Slimane like there's just very very different people that understand the, the language of that kind of revolutionary woman of the era um, so that's yeah, kind of what I try to get across in that chapter and, and that's also so interesting, too, because, I mean, I've always collected old, old Eve through the years, you know, and there's something yeah. that's so interesting about the clothes, because even the stuff that, because he did have a little dowdy, fussy period, let's, let's not, you know, let's call a spade a spade on them. There were a few years there where it was mm, not that pretty, but if you took got away from those few pieces and you went to some of the, the really big moments, that stuff is just like, I put it up, some of those pieces on today and people are like, where is that? That's beautiful. And it's like, oh, it's my old follow on Fuchsia Soul Top. Or, oh, it's my old this, it's my old that. And there's something that's so interesting because it transcends time and it doesn't look dated yeah. and it doesn't look dowdy. It, it was more the way it was I mean, the, the capability of kind of creating something that looks completely of its own time and yet, yeah. to your point, still 30 years later doesn't look like dowdy or frumpy or weird is is like an incredible skill. Um, yeah, and I think out of so all that of them, was, that's think, the most in, in you know in yeah. there. And even the way the brand is now, you know, it's just it's yeah. completely a different customer, and it's so much younger. And, and and I know the whole big fuss when it changed over, but my God, it's got that hip rocker edge, but it still has the essence in there. Well, and honestly, like you know, it's so funny when Slimane first took the stage there. You know, people were, it was like a, such a critical success, that first collection, because he brought back all of these old Eve's tropes and really did them beautifully. And then the next season, he came out with this, like, grungy, very Slimane, Ellie Rocker mm -hmm. chick version of them, and people were like, what are you doing? But for me, it's like the whole DNA of the brand is is catching people off guard and kind of flipping mm -hmm. the institution of, like, high fashion on its head so that you're really dealing with, like, a revolution, you know? So... To me, he was like the best kind of embodiment of some, of someone that could, you know, uh, be a successor to Eve. Yeah, no, absolutely. And if you look at all those photos back in the, you know, the the where it was in the Morocco days, I mean, that stuff was pretty cut, cutting it in avant garde too. So sure, and even the the toad chic stuff, like the the you know happy hooker collection of seventy one mm -hmm. that that Saint Laurent did, like people hated that collection, like the crit, the critical press panned it. And it like now if we when we look back on it, it's like one of the most identifiable things he did. Mm -hmm. So so that that chapter is very much about that girl who's just like, you know, it's like the girl you want to be. Um, yeah. And um and I think I, from there I kind of went into almost the extreme opposite. Um, which you know I think to some degree those those two houses almost represent the spectrum of fashion so I went in, I went to Dior and the romantic and this this aesthetic it's like completely cultivated and completely artificial and just decorated and gorgeous but it's like the opposite of the like laissez-faire laissez -faire, like girl about town you know it's, it's a little like it's definitely girl. a little more fussy a little more thought out yeah I mean more, it's yeah. just but it's still beautiful immaculate and it's yeah. oh it's gorgeous but it's like it's like 
you know, stepping into, it's like literally going from like the French street to the French salon. It's, you know, it's a mm-hmm. very different feel. Um, so that was, that chapter kind of played on, of course, the new look silhouette was the predominant one, but then into all the different kind of H and A and trapez and all, all sorts of different signature lines that were created there over the decades. And, you know, were, were at, at the time that I finished the book, it was, Raph was still there. Um, and he just did this incredible job of retaining, you know, the signatures of Dior without, actually without um, making them overly fettered, which was, I think, is, was an extraordinary He's skill. He's just an incredible designer. I, I think I yes. took whatever I could from Jill Sandra when he was there as much as I could. Yeah. I mean, the stuff is for you. Flawless. It's just beautiful. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't familiar, going, going back a little in history, the Dior New Look, which was 1947, I'm sure you all know if you would see it. It, it was it was really quite cutting edge and revolutionary at the time. And it, it's the peplum jackets that they cut, they're they single breasted and they're very nipped in, in the waist and they come out in the peplum and then it's the mid calf pleated skirt. And at that time, that was it really, really turned the, the world on its. Uh, well, it was like the world was very ready to pretty go. Kid meals. Yeah, yeah, the world was like ready to go towards the '60s, right? It, when when Dior came on the scene, they were ready to go for sh- shortened hemlines and more freedom of movement. And he like literally came in and was like, "No, no, you know, like fashion is not um, comfort. Fashion is cultivated beauty, and this is what it looks like. And it's too bad if it's inconvenient." You know, <laughs> so it really almost like reversed fashion time for a second and took it into this gorgeous fantasy place, which, you know, to some degree, Galliano was this master of re-enlivening that, that fantasy, you know, conversation at, at Dior. Um, and his, I think his greatest skill with that brand was in keeping the mythology of it alive, the like, the kind of um, theater of it alive. Which yeah, well, it is definitely. For Dior himself. Yeah, it is fashion with a capital F. That that whole yes. I mean, this that yes. is not for the shy girl who doesn't like to get dressed up. Let's. <laughs> but now, if you're for sure, but yeah. now if you're like looking at at their spokesmodels, you look at like Jennifer Lawrence. You know, she's not a girl who's going to be like sitting quietly in a corner. She's no. like a really modern kind of very, you know, progressive and assertive person. And I think that um, her under wraps collections was really a great fit so it's not necessarily about you know being a um prim and proper to your point of fussy it as much as it's about being whatever the kind of most fantastical envisionment of a woman is you know at any given time well you have a quote in here it was about albert and where i'm looking for my notes and i kind of just loved it it was it was a quote someone pulled but it's a really good thing here it was so long ago. Oh, I have my little note. It's basically oh, is that he is was interested more in designing a dress that a woman wears when she falls in love with herself. And I think yeah. that is just yeah. such a beautiful quote. So if yeah. you want to just go a little bit more on that. because Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Albert, you know, Albert was such a beautiful light at that house um, and such an extraordinary designer in general. You know, Longvin, I think, would have been very – would have been completely forgotten by time, um, not unlike um, Kyosu and um, Patu, sadly, like, you know, even though that's a little bit more um, well-known. But there were so many gorgeous, gorgeous brands in the 19 teens and 20s um, that were kind of, that have kind of been lost by time. And I think the reason why Longvin has, you know, resurfaced and survived is that Albert was really able to see the um, admiration and the um significance of the woman herself in, in Jean Lenlen's image. You know, she she was very much about femininity, very much about motherhood. She was about, you know, a woman's ability to do everything that she wanted to do and have the clothes to feel good in doing it. And I think Albert was the designer who could come in and say, you know, I might still be designing runway fashion, but I'm designing runway fashion that's going to make women look and feel good. Absolutely. And that's what's important to me here. Yeah, there, there, there's something in that, that whole in all those collections, it's just there's such a, like an inherent beauty it's, to there's it. There's a freedom, and it's free. Yeah, it's, there's like a freedom to that those clothes. You know that it, it's about celebration. You know, and it's about like kind of letting your 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 wallflower like it turn blossom into a different kind of flower. You know, and in in the book you have some really beautiful photos um, 
one of them is it's a dress that's kind of like a sleeveless sheath. It's like an inky blue, and it has this most fantastic yeah. sculptural ruffle down. I yeah. know, it's just like I love they're that just shot. breathtaking. And you yeah, know, if someone is looking at one. there's just there's just so many gorgeous ones. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. I, you know, it was it was a treat to to just weed through this photography and I had a great, great really image assistant and I just you know, it was really just a, it was like uncovering treasures. You know, and then, and then on, on the next page is a picture of the, the redheaded model with the big beige top with the big yes. bow and the ruffle. And it's just well, the bow, so yeah, ethereal. such a huge thing. I mean, the thing I kind of found so fascinating about Albert was that he was able to take these kind of very, like, kind of infantile symbols, like the bow and the, like, you know, the the ruffled skirt, like all sorts of things that you associate with, like, little girls kind of and make them, these, like, quite sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, when he started doing the L'Enfant Petit collection, um, I think it was, like, around 2011 or something, 2012 maybe, he was, you know, he started doing those collections, and it just was like, oh, my God, genius. Like, you're going to kind of use the same fabric for mother and daughter and the dress plays on both women. Like, you really see the vision of this works on women of all ages, which is, you know, so challenging. It's, like, it's an extraordinary feat. And also to have something that's so feminine without being girly and infantile. Yes. That's just sort of feminine and sensual at the same time. Yes. It, it's it's something that feminine you know, people, without being silly or frilly. Yeah, that, that people, you know, people, I know when I work with a lot of, you know, regular women, they're like, oh, I want to be feminine. And to them, feminine is just, I don't know. It's almost like, what, what are you going to wear to the, you know, the horse races? It's like, that's not feminine. That's sort of some girly fascination of it, but to be able to, to nail it and hone it in such a way that it's so beautiful and timeless. And it's like voluptuous femininity and the ruffles and the fabrications. Yeah. And, and for, for those of you who are, you know, you're saying, okay, I can never, I can never wear couture just beyond listening to what we're saying right now. Just look at the, book really treat yourself with this because there's just so much inspiration and even this one photo with the beige big ruffle of thinking like at home you could be inspired and maybe you just want to tie a scarf around your neck that way or wear your hair that way or think of maybe instead of the dress with the big blue ruffle down the back just add that kind of silhouette in in a jacket or a layer or something to your you know just be inspired by the beauty of something that's just so breathtaking and just look at what you have in your life and and just, you know, let it just take over your hands when you get dressed in the morning and maybe tie your jacket a certain way or flip your collar or wear a white shirt with your jacket and do like a tuxedo suit. I mean, just keep your eyes open to get inspired from all of this. It's The, the book is just so beautiful. I can't say it any other way. Oh, thank but, you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's a labor I just love, love that book. Uh, yeah, next time, can I help curate your photos? You know, would you like to? Oh, my so God, far? I love it. Please help. No, I mean, um, I, really lo- like, I really liked, you know, it was such a wonderful thing to be able to write that book. And, um, you know, it, of all the projects that I've worked on, it was um, it was a true kind of fashion historian's delight to kind of go through these houses and, and call the things that just really were at their heart and core. So one of the thing, one of the things I want to go through in a fashion historian because it's just such a such a complete 360 is let's talk about Givenchy for a minute from you know the street cred right now to back yeah. in the day of Audrey Hepburn and I mean you can't have yeah. a bigger shift and you know yeah I mean you know it. I think obviously Tishi is really really good at dealing with personalities and dressing personalities and the celeb thing and the kind of street style thing has been a, a distinct part of his brand but I think you know Hubert de Givenchy who founded the brand he was an aristocrat and he owned you know he was a furniture collector he was a collector of art he he, he kind of mashed together all of these references and from what I hear was quite you know he was self-made and he was quite um intentional about it and I think Tishi's done a great job of doing the same of kind of calling all these references from like art and history and culture and style and mashing them into silhouettes that just feel wearable and fun I mean even that hot Audrey Hepburn pieces they might not they might have been tailored and kind of crisp and not have all the embroidery or um, the various kind of controversial cuts that, that Tishi's been kind of proponent of, but they they were still these clothes that women just wanted. I mean, craved. Mm-hmm. Like, they were like the enviable clothes. So, 
for me, Givenchy she was was very much about taking the highbrow and making it the the like kind of every woman's. No, it was kind of taking it from like super chic to making it cool. Well, that was yeah, exactly. pretty cool in her own right, but you know that just that whole yeah. look. Yeah. So is it, we only have a couple more minutes, and and is there anything else from the book? I mean, I'm just I'm just flipping pictures here, everyone. It's like you should be flipping pictures too. It's just so beautiful. I mean, oh, is so there funny. anything? I mean, <laughs> I'm just like I could go I, I here really, for hours. I love, love, loved working on the last half of the book. Um, it to me felt almost like a, a movie narrative because, you know, I started the I started the second half with um, Vuitton, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and um, moved into Hermes, and each of them are kind of like Hermes being like the art of sport and Vuitton being the art of luggage, and, or the you know, and the travel. And then Balenciaga, I, I finished the book with Balenciaga because to me he'll always be, fa like that brand will always be fas fashion's future. Um, and, you know, whether it's you're talking about Cristobal or whether you're talking about Wang, you know, it's it's like this aesthetic of the kind of sleek future, and um, Besquier obviously did such extraordinary stuff mm -hmm. there, and his work was on the ready to wear one runway was so close to couture that I think it actually changed the industry. Um, you know, it was painstakingly custom, so I really um, credit him a lot with that elevation of the ready to wear in Paris, and also just the capability to kind of bring artistry into. Um, a high fashion collection that wasn't necessarily like Le Marier or some traditional couture artistry, but was like, you know, the 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 like craftsmanship of plastics for for heels that was like so precise and so gorgeous, um, just high tech materials and and the manipulation of them to give people something truly unique and visionary. So that was to me that was a super fun chapter and um, both Vuitton and Hermes just digging in the archives of these kinds. Of 20s advertisements and all sorts of things like that was just so so much fun. But all in all, I really really um, enjoyed the book. I hope people can take from it an understanding of how long these houses have been around and how they've really, um, you know, continued of course to create new and new and new, but always come back to their grief. Always come back, you know, gr grief G R I F F E S. <laughs> always come back <laughs> to their like symbols, you know, so yeah, that they're and, and you know able to maintain the vision. Can, do you want to explain what that is a little bit for those who are not familiar with it? I mean, we all know it when we see it, just, but you may not know its proper name. So just um, a grief kind of referencing the kind of signature, the trope of the house, like something that you that you look at and you say, well, that is for sure a Chanel piece, or that's for sure a Dior piece. There's no there's no way that that wasn't created by Bouton. Um I see that like kind of logo brand fabric. So all of the houses now, they have those symbols, and I think that's – in part why they've been so successful because they've continued to work from them and evolve them. So I like to ask everyone, if you can tell people like one thing to be more amazing this week. I mean, for me, it's like, if you want to be more amazing, just get the new French couture by Alyssa Dumont. And when you're really bored and don't know what to do, just flip through a few pages and get inspired. But <laughs> it's really incredible. But can you, if you want to just tell us, like, what what do you think, if you had to just sum up, like, one thing someone can do with sort of the essence of couture to, to be a little more amazing in their life, whether it would be, like, looking at the clothes to get inspired or something you've, you've gleaned from working with the houses or whatever it is, like, what do you think someone's takeaway to be a little more amazing in the next week? I mean, I don't know how much it relates to couture, but I think it does relate to effortless style, which is, you know, above everything. I think you really have to feel good in what you're wearing, you know, no matter how beautiful a dress is, if you're shifting around, if you're feeling kind of crazy in it or like it doesn't fit you well, you're going to look crazy. So mm -hmm. whatever you do and whatever you kind of put on, I think it's really, really important to be like kind of comfortable in that skin and feel like it represents who you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in so many ways, too, I also, you know, it's how you present yourself, especially women in business. It's just, you know, I, I know a lot of women who, you know, they, they, they're, they're work from home, they're entrepreneurs or authors or writers or speakers. And when they sort of get out there, they don't, they, someone else dresses them and it never feels, you know, yeah. it's not right on them. It's like in the yeah. old days. You have to you, go with your gut you have to and go remember that the you know the the women that have the, have had the best style in history have always trusted their own instincts as opposed to kind of putting on a different stylish. face that wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. You you've got to be in control of your look, or it's just not gonna it's not gonna look right. It's gonna be and that know, has to come not, from something natural. It can't come from something that's just completely cultivated. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Style has to be natural to you, to the wearer. So yeah. thank you so much for being with thank us Thank you today. so much. I really appreciate it. And, and um, yeah, I'm, I hope people find the book, you know, compelling and beautiful and that it makes a nice, nice addition to their their room or their collection or their library. Or their or their dresser. <laughs> or their dresser, yes. Yes. But anyway, thank you for being here. We'll put all the information. Um, if you're listening to us on iTunes, you can pop over to the Seven Days to Amazing page and focus on style, and you'll get all the where to buys on it. Anyone else? It's the new French couture icons of Paris fashion, and um, you could get it where I'm assuming it's at Amazon and most major bookstores. Yep, Barnes and Noble, um, Amazon, kind of booksellers across the country. Um, visit your bookstore. That's it. That's it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for being here. And everyone, we will see you on the next episode of 7 Days to Amazing. Take care. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. That's a wrap. Well, not so fast. Don't forget to hop over to FocusOnStyle.com for exclusive content to help you live your most amazing life with style and success. For even more great stuff that Sharon only shares by email, subscribe to her in the know list at www.focusonstyle.com slash insiders. See you next time. 